Come on, give me a second. Oh, shoot. There's a cat trying to get in. Excuse me. Just wondered what the noise was. Okay, that's us recording. So, as ever, uh, anyone get anything from last week that they want to ask? Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Okay. So, uh, we're going to do it in the same way as we've done before. So, um, we'll do a, a code along. So, the the slides are on Aula and in Teams. Um, I'll probably not bother with the slides because you can go back and look at them and it's just really what I'm going to be talking about anyway. Uh, Jen, see, you just weren't at the lab this morning. Uh, one of the things I was asked about at the lab this morning was about the choice thing. Because choice was supposedly giving you a random uh, item. But it doesn't, as you notice. And some people see that as a bug. I see that as a feature. The reason being, if you have anything that randomizes in your program, how do you test it? How do you, not knowing what the input is going to be, test the output? So there are multiple ways of getting random numbers in Python. All random number generators rely on what we call a seed, basically a starting number. What you can do is supply the same seed and you'll get the same sequence of random numbers. So random should actually be called pseudo random because it's not really random. It's just and sequence of numbers that jumps about and looks random to us. But actually it's using the same seed number and giving the same sequence using a mathematical function, assuming you use the same seed. Quite often what we will do to get something that's truly random is we will use multiple seeds. So uh, often we'll use something like the system clock and we'll supply that as the seed number to the random number generator so that every time we run the program, we start at a different sequence. With um, Python, you'll get the same kind of sequence. So you can run that and you'll know that when you're testing it, you get the same thing every time. But there are multiple things in there so that you can um, change how that works. So if you look at the methods that are available in random, you'll find that there's both choice and choices, and they give you subtly different outputs. So you can have a look at those to stop the repeat. The other one you have is something called random.sample. So not only will that stop the repeat, it will also guarantee that it only uses one of uh, one item ever. So it's, if, it's, if it's already chosen the lead pipe, it won't choose the lead pipe again. So look for choice, choices and sample. And that will take you down the road of stopping the repeat and letting you um, not have more than one of each type. Uh, does that help? I mean, yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, Roland, yeah, just because I was talking, I hadn't even thought about what was on line. One of these days I will get into one of these things and actually properly put my devices onto sample mode. Silent mode even. 
Um, OK, so anything else from last week? Sample's quite a good one because it also lets you do things. Uh, so the example that I'd given in the class this morning had looked at that list. So what I'd done is I'd set up an essence, uh, not quite a full set of cards, Ace of Hearts, Two of Hearts, Three of Hearts, Four of Hearts, and so on. And I just um, showed the difference between random choice, choices, and sample. If I just quickly run it. Choice gives two of spades. Choices, we can see how many we want. So we can get, grab five cards, but you'll see there's a 4C and a 4C. So you still might have a repeat. And then there's sample, where we've got five cards, but we're guaranteed no repeats. OK, so you can use those depending on what it is you want to do. Rather annoyingly, I had done this this morning and I could not get choices to give me a repeat. And the first time I do it now, it's worked. OK, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Anything else from last week? Um, I've just got one question. What does uh, K equals five mean? Uh, how many you want from the list. So we've got four times four. We've got 16, so it wants five from our list. Yeah, um, Return a case sized populate list of population elements chosen with their placement. And they've used K because it's a common thing in the statistical theory to use the number K. All right, so okay. people that use this all the time are used to seeing K. And people aren't just it is, it's K. Still though. So that's a single letter. And to answer Roland's question. The answer is yes. That's every item, but hopefully only one of each and in a random order. Do you know, I know how this is supposed to work, but I still look at it thinking, did it do it right? Did it do it right? That's exactly the sort of thing you would use it for, Roland, shuffling the cards. So you set up the, the main one and then you can just make out a new list by getting that one back and that gives you a shuffled set of cards, or indeed a random set of anything. So if you've got anything where you've got suspects, locations, weapons, you can start off with the original one, use this to shuffle it, and then just dole them out one at a time, and you know that it's random. So you don't have to actually even get them randomly. You randomize them once, and then you just do one at a time, whatever's coming next, which is quite handy. Any other questions from last week? OK, so as I said, I'm going to go through this week's lecture, which is about encapsulation. And I do love the multisyllabic words. Um, two things. I am. Um, As I said, I'm going to run through the, the lecture, so if you've got it, you'll see that I'm just doing what's in the lecture. But I'm not bothering going back and forward to the lecture. You can look at that later uh, because the lecture is, in essence, just going through uh, setting up the code. 
Second thing is I haven't set up anything from scratch. Remember last week I did some pasting just to speed things up for this lecture. I did have some feedback that some of you were following along and not surprisingly, you couldn't keep up with a control V. Um, so I'm just going to type it in from scratch. So apologies, it will be a bit slower, but then on the other hand, if you're following along, it means you can do it at the, at the uh, same time. And the third one is my Visual Studio seems to be going really slowly. Um, I've been doing some AI stuff in Python and I loaded in a whole bunch of libraries. And um, you can actually see this. You could see the, the terminal thing actually going letter by letter at some points. So um, it seems to have sped up again. I think it was because I was using um, the AI I've got um, multiple environments here. So the thing's called Anaconda to let me do um, AI and uh, image recognition and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's because I had that selected. So I've just gone back to the standard one and gone back to the standard uh, console as well. Hopefully that sped up a bit, but just a, a quick warning. It's not because I'm using a Surface Pro. It normally is, but it's not today. But thanks. I mean, I mean it's because you're using and like you're trying to program AI on a Surface Pro. <laughs> uh, just you, you need so many libraries, and it was it took uh, a good seven or eight minutes just to download and install all the libraries yesterday. Um, is it worth it at that point, or can you just like not get a new PC? <laughs> oh, once installed, it's not so bad, but it just took ages to install them, set up all the dependencies, figure out how they work. Now it's installed, it was running. Um, but I, because of what I was really saying was I've installed a lot of new stuff. So if it slows down and I'm kind of going, uh, it's because I did all that yesterday and, uh, and I might have missed something. And as Jen points out, it has been going OK. That's why I was using Visual Studio. It did struggle a wee bit with PyCharm. Not that I could install it anyway. Um, but Visual Studio has been OK. OK, so. Actually, your mini Surface is faster than my old Surface Pro. OK. You fail. So not surprisingly, we're continuing on with the thing that definitely isn't Cluedo. OK. And What we want to do today is encapsulation. So last time we talked about composition, so that was bringing in multiple classes. Here we want to look at encapsulation. The idea is whenever we create classes, whenever we create modules for our code, everything should be in there. Everything that we need should be in there and it shouldn't be exposed to the outside world unless we want them to see it. So it should be a black box. That black box should also include the data that we use as well as the methods. So the idea with encapsulation is we are going to start building things where nothing is available outside the method and outside the class unless we want it to be. That means that we can distribute our things and we have a very clear interface. So we can set up what's called an API, an application program interface, and we can say 
the things that you can use are this, this and this. The things that you can use in the random code that I've created are choice, choices and sample. There's lots more, by the way, that's just an example. OK, so what we're trying to do is just make sure that we encapsulate everything in our class. All methods and all data. So that's what we're going to try and do. And some of you asked about Cluedo and how you did certain things about making some of the data available elsewhere. I'm going to come at it from the other side by not making the data available, but by setting it up so that we can ask the class anything that we need and have it passed out. Hopefully that will become clearer as we go through the code. OK, so if you want to code along, now's the time. We are going to, as we did before, set up our suspect list. incredibly interesting for you sitting there watching me type. And you'll see I'm doing what I did last week in terms of the list, just to make it easy to see everything that's on there. Oh, thanks, Alistair. Yeah, you've made it to copy and paste, and I've got to type it in. Thanks a bunch. Everybody that wants to unmute and start singing, now would be the time. Does he sing about what? Hey, singer's choice. Okay, so there's our rooms, and finally we have our, our weapons. Okay, so we have <clears throat> suspects, rooms and weapons. So let's start building some code. If you know um, Cluedo, you'll know that at the start you take the suspects, rooms and the weapons, you shuffle the cards, and you take one of each. 
and you put those into a, a wee envelope and they are the guilty people. And then you play the game by trying to figure out who each of those is. So what we are going to do as part of our class guilty is That part of the game. So we're going to say the guilty murderer is somebody from the suspect. You might have to import random. No need for me to say why is a line under random then. Don't forget, we need to import anything that we're going to use. In this case, it's random. Okay, so we're going to set up the murderer. Wait, did we, wait, didn't we, when, did we go over this is like five sec, uh, minutes ago uh, between choice and sample? So, you want to choose people to fight? I'm just going to stick with choice. Your door, Tony. Yeah. So, thank you. So we set up a class called guilty and that becomes our solution. Solution becomes who is guilty. And we can just actually say in the main body We can see who did it. We can see where they did it. And we can see what they used. OK, so we can just quickly test that. And we can see that Miss Scarlett did it in the conservatory with the lead pipe. I'm not sure what those murderer isn't set up in line 28. Murderer we're declaring, so we're setting up a new variable it's not called a variable in a class we're just setting that up we can set up any new things remember we did that before okay and we can run this and get who did it Okay, so far. I've got this peacock five times in a row, goddamn. Okay, so we're setting up guilty in the initialization. We're setting up a whole bunch of. I keep going to say variables, and it's not variables. Some to remind me what it is if it's in a class. Attributes. Thank you. We set up a whole bunch of attributes murder, or scene of crime, and murder weapon. And to set them up, we randomly choose them from our suspects, rooms, and weapons lists. In the main body, we then set up a new variable called the solution. And we get that by setting up a new instance of guilty, 
which sets that up and then we can print off our solution. Thing is, it's not very object oriented. Why are we, for example, printing out the solution in our main body? Shouldn't that be something that's bound up with the class? Should we, for example, define a another class, another method in our class, Well done, Thomas. So we can do the same sort of thing and I'll just copy and paste. Don't forget, we need to do the indentations or it thinks that's part of the main body. So we'll just indent this. Anything else we need to change? Change it from Delta A to display solution. We'll need to add that in, so we'll need to display the solution, but anything else we need to change for this method? Yeah. We can't have solution. Solution is the variable we declared in line 40. That doesn't exist. In the class, in the class, it's not solution.murderer, it is self.murderer. So it's whatever one we have. So we can. Just to prove it, I'm going to just put in, this is in the class. Okay, so we've got a display solution in the class and we've got a display solution in the main body. And I can just say, for this variable solution that we've now created, as an instance of class guilty, we will use solution dot display solution. Happy? Yes or no? Happy? I'd say so. I think you should put the uh, brackets at the end of the display solution. Me too. Okay, so we can set that up and if my Output screen was bigger. You could see that in the class, we've got Professor Plum did it in the study with the revolver, and then in the main body, we've got Professor Plum did it in the study with the revolver. So we're getting it in both places. But this is a more object oriented solution, having it in the class, because it binds everything together. It encapsulates it. It encapsulates everything that we want to do with this class, within the class, and that's a good thing. Everyone happy with that before we move on? I've just left myself a wee note, and this is a useful thing to do. Um, you all know about comments with the hash. So I've left myself a comment that says remove this when encapsulated. But I've also put in to do, and you'll see it's even put it in in a nice different colour. What that will do is 
It means we can either manually search the list or for some IDEs, it will actually create a to-do list with all the things that you have commented with to-do. So that as you're creating your code and you think, oh, I need to remember and do that, you can do that and go back to them either manually by searching for to-do or by going to the to-do list that your IDE has created for you. I would highly encourage you to do this as you go along. Um, <laughs> I get it to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would highly encourage you to do this as you go along because it um, you forget stuff. Well, well, I forget stuff. So you can start to do things like this. Or that. And then you can go back and look at them later. For Visual Studio Code, if you happen to be using it, There's a wee extension that you can install. <laughs> I already got that. And I can't see where to run it. OK, now I can go there and just say, all right, look, I need to, to do this and it'll take me straight to my to do list. You have to stop taunting the data, man. <laughs> yeah, and just go to extensions, just type in to do or to do tree and it should find it. OK, so that was just a wee extra one. Just to remind me to do that. You'll see I've installed that extension and it's also made it a, it's also um, highlighted it differently so you can see it. There's loads of them, Ben. There's loads of these to do ones. You saw that when I searched for it. So I don't know why that one came up first for me, but you can see how many of them there are.
OK, so back to our code. The reason I put fix and calculation in there is that I don't think we're done yet. I think there's more things that we can encapsulate within our class. Not least. The fact that we may not want some of the code that we have created to run to show, so we might want to hide some of the methods. And. Oh, I see, Jen. Uh, you, I think, already have a to do. If it's a full Visual Studio, I think there's a to do already in there. But I can't remember where. Um, so, yeah, so you might create code that helps you do your stuff, but you might not want to make it available to the people that are using your class. And the same thing might happen with the data. You might not want people to see who the murderer is. So you might want to hide that part. So if we have things that we want to hide, in other words, things that we cannot call from outside of the class, we can hide it simply by using our double underscore. You see it, it's changed it and it's going to it's still brown, but it's a light brown. So that's now hidden. And if I run this code, you can see that our solution display solution gets upset. And it says guilty object, so a guilty class has no attribute display solution. Just by adding in those two underscores, we have hidden display solution. The obvious thing to get it back would be to change how we call it and put the double underscores there. But that doesn't work either. There's no way of displaying the solution from outside the class now. So we've set it up so that we can never display the solution unless we do it within the class itself. So we can do a whole bunch of stuff within our class. We can use a whole bunch of functions and set them all up without making them appear elsewhere. What it doesn't do is stop you getting access to the data. So I can still call murderer, scene of crime and murder weapon from within, from outside the class and get the answer. So the data is still available outside the class. Anybody want to suggest how we hide the data? Would you do the same thing, just put two underscores underneath it? Absolutely. So if it's data that you don't want to appear outside your class, so it's data that you need to calculate or do things with or store, but you don't want people to see it, Double underscore. And I'll put it in there as well, or it will get upset. Now, murderer, 
is only available in the class. And as before, even if I try and get access to it, it tells me there is no attribute murderer. So now the murderer is only available in the class. The other stuff's still there, so I can prove that to you just by commenting that out. So conservatory and candlestick, no problem. They weren't underscored for scene of crime and murder weapon, but the murderer just can't get access. Everyone happy with that? OK. So. So we can't get access outside, but we probably still want access. Otherwise, we'll never know. If we have won the game. So let's start thinking about what other stuff that we want to put in our class that will let us do that. Let's, instead of just displaying the solution, let's check the solution. So we're going to set up a method that you can see, I think it was Miss Scarlet. in the drawing room. With the candlestick. And as we would normally do, we'll just do a quick check. If the murderer, if that's this murderer here, the one that we've passed. If the murderer is the same as this instance of the class, murderer so it's the one with the two underscores so that's this one so if the one we pass to it is the same as the one that we have created We can ask it got to a print. There. We can ask it to print out that you want. Otherwise, OK, so we can check murder, murderer that we pass to it with the murderer that we have set up to begin with. And we can put in some code to do that. So just some simple Felt it with an O there. Was that intentional? Okay, so we can get our murderer. We can get our input or where it happened.
And could we have these questions be um, their own object? What was the question there? Never mind, I'm sure you'll get to it. OK, so we can get the input. We can then say solution dot actually set up solution to begin with. Solution dot check solution and we can pass it the murderer that we have identified the scene of crime. We have come up with and the of the weapon we've chosen. OK. Now remember, these are different things, even though I've used the same name. The murder variable here is different to the one that's used in here is different to the one that's used up here. OK. We're just passing them. So it's asking us who did it. Mrs. Peacock. What did happen? The hall. What did they use? The spanner. It said, guess again, Watson, and I hadn't removed the stuff from the main body, and you can see it was a dining room and the rope. Anybody get any questions about that before we move on? Uh, can you please explain again the, what happened with the murderer? What do you mean it's, it's not the same? I mean... Well, we have identified a murderer here. We've identified a murderer, and I mean by identify, I mean we've given the name to a variable. So in the main body, we've set up a variable called murderer. In the class, we have set up a parameter called murderer. And as part of the instance of that class, we have set up a murderer. They're different things, so don't get them confused. We could have called this, for example, Period. Uh, OK, so it's just passing the, the data. We're just passing it, yeah. OK, OK, so thank you. It's worth using your debugger to check what value your variables have at particular times. In fact, I'll probably just do that and show you what I mean. OK, so I'll check my debugger there and I will debug. And I'll set a breakpoint there, so it'll stop there and let me jump through it a line at a time. I'm also going to watch expression, so I can say what's the value of murderer. Of crime. And murder weapon. Why are they all saying that there's a name error? Why are murder seen in crime giving me and murder weapon giving me errors? Because we haven't put any input yet. Yep, we are only here. So this yellow line here shows where we are in the code. We haven't actually set up the murder or the scene of crime or the murder weapon. As we go through it, however, 
So I can work my way through. So here we're setting up the solution. So it's getting a murderer, getting a scene of crime, getting a murder weapon. And then it's going to ask me who I think the murderer is. And it's only once I put it in that it appears here. So only once we've actually set it up and set a value does it actually, thank you, does it actually. <laughs> the tea dispenser is back. Cheers. OK, so you see in the left hand column, now the murderer is shown because we've set it up and I've put a value in. But scene of crime still hasn't been set up. We haven't done it yet. Where did it happen? The hall. So watch over here. Currently not available. Why is it not available actually? We're running this line. Why is it not available? Maybe because it's waiting for an input. Kind of. Keep going. Uh, someone help me out here. <laughs> what actually is input? I thought it only. I thought it all, doesn't it only like accept once you press enter or something? Yeah, but why aren't we seeing it here? Why did murderer disappear? And why is scene of crime not available? That is a very good question. Thank you. Do you want to give me a very good answer? Hmm. Is it something about it being stored in the temporary memory until it's assigned to the variable? No. No. I mean, it was Where are temporary. We in the code? Where are we in the code just now? Well, we are at scene of crime. Are we? What a solution? It's asking you where did it happen, so I would guess so, right? Yeah, you would guess that, but we're not there. What is, I'll ask it again, what is input? And the fact that there's brackets after it might give you a hint. Oh, it's a function? Yep. So where is the code just now? Um, I didn't have enough coffee for this. Oh, putting well, all that data into the whatever classy bit you've got up the top. Not exactly. It's currently running the input function. It's running the input function to see where did it happen. So just oh, wait, like, so everything so everything is local to that function. So uh, yep. the murder is stored, but it's only stored in the murder function. It's not stored in the scene of crime. Is that it? No, no. Oh, never mind. Murder or scene of crime and murder weapon are in our main program. But we are not running code in our main program just now. We are running code in the input function. And in the input function, there are there are no variables called murder or scene of crime or murder weapon. So they are not available. They don't exist in input. We are actually running a function just now. It's not a function we wrote, but that's what we're doing. We're calling a function and running it. Oh, wait. So scene of crime doesn't exist for the input because it exists inside of scene of crime? Is that sort of... Scene of crime doesn't exist for input because it's a function that gets put. It exists in our main program here, but we are not in our main program just now. We are in ah. the input function. Okay, okay, I'm starting to get it. So as soon as I hit enter here, we will come out of the input function and come back to our main program, at which point both murderer and scene of crime will become available because we will be back at our main code 
in line 51. So we now have Colonel Peacock as the murderer and Hall as scene of crime. Because we've actually got that input from the input function and we're back here. And you can see it's we know that we're back here because it's gone yellow again. It's highlighting the line that we are on. OK, so it like entered a program inside of the program in a way. And if I go here, you can't see it when I zoom in, you can just about see it. That says step into. It means step into the function. I could just step over it. So I could just say ex execute the function and don't worry me about what's happening in there. But what I'm saying is no step into it so that we can see what happens. And what happens is all our variables, so our list of murderers and um, rooms and weapons, all of our things that we've created here, when we are going into input, they will disappear. So I'm going to say step into the next thing. And the next thing is input. So we are currently in the input function and none of those things exist in the input function. So they disappear at that level. But when I type in what, when I type in the input and hit enter, we come out, we return from the input function, we come back to our main code and you'll see the main code then being highlighted and the variables that we have at that point becoming available again. OK, and that might be easier when I step into again, because here what we're doing is we're stepping into code that we've created. So check solution is code that we've created. So this yellow highlight will jump up to check solution because we've just called it. And it's going to go through and it's going to say is the murderer correct? Yeah. What was that? Somebody is singing now. OK, so it wasn't, I didn't correctly guess the murderer. So it's going to print guess again, Watson. And it comes back out of the code. And I'll just do that just to finish it off. So that's what this hiding stuff does. We don't know what's happening in the input function. Somebody has written that. There's clearly going to be variables in there where they get the temporary input and where they sort it out and send it back, but we don't get access to them. All we get access to for the input function is what's returned. And that's what we're trying to reach here when we encapsulate our classes. What's returned is only what we want to be returned. Everything else, all the other code is hidden. It becomes a black box. You put stuff in, you get stuff out, and what happens inside? Well, that's somebody else's problem. And that's actually really helpful. So think about if you're creating a bigger program. We'll take Cluedo, which we could split up. You could, for example, have one programmer working on the board. And the board displays the board and sends the pieces onto the board exactly where they live. How that happens, how the graphics happen, how that's displayed, no one else cares. All you need to know is Miss Scarlet is in the hall with the candlestick. And whoever's programming the board, you pass that on to them and they do it somehow. 
So we can split up our functions. We can split up a program into functions. People can create those functions. And the only way they communicate is through the parameters that we pass and the values that we get back. Does that make sense? Affirmative. I have scrolled down anyway, that is the, the bottom. OK, so when you're doing your code, use this debug if you haven't already. Um, there's a very similar thing in PyCharm if you're using PyCharm. And what it will do is it will let you see each line of code. It will follow it through so you know exactly where you're going. And it'll let you better understand where you are in the code and what the values are in there. That's why I was stressing about the murderer here not being the same as the murderer up here, not being the same as the murderer attached to the class. And you saw that as we went through. Even though we have something identified as murderer, sometimes it exists, sometimes it doesn't, and it depends where you are. And you have to be really clear about where you are and what you have. And I know that some of you were running into issues last week about passing parameters and what exists where and how you get it back out. But that's a feature, not a bug. What we need to do is use that. Everyone happy with that as far as it goes? I know it's a wee bit kind of, huh? but play around with it and you'll get it. Anybody get any questions about it just now? If you think hard enough, every bug's a feature. <laughs> OK, so if you're happy with that, I'm going to add on something else that's new. Because the rules of Cluedo don't say, tell me who the murderer is. They also say, me if the scene of crime was right and tell me if the murder weapon So all three of those things have to be true for the solution to be correct. So I'm going to show you two things. One is a new keyword. So you've all done computer systems by now. Jennifer, you're right, it does need all of them to be true. And you've done computer systems, you've done logic, so you know that the logic for this has to be true and something else has to be true and something else has to be true for the whole thing to be true requires an and. So if the murderer is the murderer and the scene of crime is the correct scene of crime, and the murder weapon is the right murder weapon, only then do you get everything right. Now, I've that's put not words, computing systems, that's English. That's both. Because there's also or and exclusive or, and they tend to move beyond English and into logic. OK, so we've set up some code to say if the murderer's right and the scene of the crime's right and the murder weapon's right, then you win. It's not happy, though. You're missing what? the backslash. What's the backslash? Because I've done it and I didn't understand what the backslash was. OK, so sometimes when we have 
white space in Python, we can just arbitrarily hit return like in our lists here and Python's happy. But for stuff like this, what we need to say is the next line is actually part of this line. So the backslash simply says extend this line onto the next one and make it one compound function. So that's all the backslash is doing there. It's just yeah. one big line. OK, so we can do that and we can check that not just is the mother At the room and the hall, and the weapon are correct. Few more things to do. We've hidden the murderer. We haven't hidden the scene of the crime or the murder weapon, and we should probably do that too. So we need to check what we're checking against, update those as well. And just to prove it, you might want to run Now that I've hidden those, we get as far as typing the stuff in. But it gets upset now with our printouts because we no longer have the scene of the crime. So we need to take those out. So we can have our check that we've won without giving away the answer. Does that make sense? Um, to me it does, yes. OK, so we can run it and we can we got it right. OK, everyone happy with that so far? Yep. OK, so the data can't be seen. And. Any of the methods that we don't want to be available outside are also hidden as well. What is chance to? Sorry, Thomas, I'm not sure what you're asking there. Um, so, so I'll just try, I don't know if you've played Cluedo or just trying to emulate what would happen. Or well, what's the chance that you win a game? Um, so it's not just a guessing game. You're supposed to go around and try and figure out. So you get cards as well, for example. So if you are Miss Scarlet, you know that Miss Scarlet didn't do it because if you've got it in your hand, it can't be in the in the envelope. So what you do is you move around and you get the chance to ask 
other people who they are or what they have, and then you start eliminating them so that you can get the answer. Thank you, Maureen. OK, well, was there a question? question mm -hmm. But in this program, do we have chance to win? That's no, what we no, wrote. We're not really playing the game. We're just emulating bits of it. So creating the whole game is quite a big, big job. So we're just doing bits of it. Yeah, we need to so, like if we might, if we made a digital, we would have to like create like the rooms virtually and stuff. It would be very difficult. So there is this book, tiny right? chance that you <laughs> okay no no problem. there is a Sorry. chance. I mean, if you happen to type in what was <laughs> randomly selected, then yeah, you can win. But it would just be. But random. I mean, in this program, so it's very easy chance... because it prints your answer before you type it in. So. But at the it's moment, it's almost, just... almost no chance to. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there is a chance. So you have a. A one in six chance of guessing the right suspect, a one in nine chance of guessing the right room, and a one in six chance of guessing the right weapon. So you have a. But to get congratulations, you won. You have to guess three of them. Yeah. At the same time. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to oh. get, if you, uh, if you did, if so you do the math, you have about a one in one. Uh, you have a one in three hundred and twenty-four chance of randomly guessing the right answer. Not more. <laughs> OK, so almost nothing. <laughs> the chances are precisely. That seems a bit cheaty, Roland. OK, so you're happy with encapsulation. You get the idea of what we're trying to do is make sure that um, only the things that we want available outside can be used. OK, one last thing. And it's not really to do with object oriented. It's just um, something to make the program a bit easier to use. Were there any issues with my guesses there? Well, yeah, you're not really like spelling the right or banner, yeah. And the so none of them are possibly be right because I didn't even take them incorrectly. We haven't checked for that, so maybe we should. Could you use no? Well, you can just create a function within the class and then check it that way. You could check if the input's part of the list. If it's not part of the list, you could say like it's not the right input. Please try again. I'm going to attack it slightly differently because we already have a whole bunch of lists with all the information in there. I don't want to repeat that. I mean, like uh, not create a separate list, but like uh, check the input against the list we already have. If they're like the inputs part of that list. Well, we could. But again, I'm going to do it slightly differently. I am going to. But. Sorry. I was going to ask because um, sometimes you might spell something wrong, like we did in the first um, assessment. We we have created something like a menu or so. That's exactly what I'm going to do. So 
So the first thing I'm going to do is for who did it. Now we know that there are six possible suspects. So I'm just going to print out Number and the suspect for that number. And then I'm going to get the input. Remember how we did that before we cast our text input to an integer, get the number, put in a wee prompt, and then we say murderer becomes suspects How much extra effort would it be to create like a graphical UI where you could just choose, like click on the things rather than having to type them in? We will do graphics later on, a wee bit of graphics. Um, as your students, you want to know this. For the assessment, you won't have to use graphics, but you can if you want. So we will cover them, but just in just an outline so that if you want to play with it, you can, but you won't have to. Right, cheers. Okay, so I can set that up, and I'll just do one. I'll just do the first one. Uh, just to see how it's going. Okay, get rid of that great point. So you can get an idea of what this is doing. OK, so it says who did it? We're going from one to six, printing the number, getting the suspect and setting up the murderer. So instead of having to type in Mrs. Peacock, I can type in But you're never going to get the zero. OK, so we have some issues. Do we need to have a plus one in there so it doesn't get the zero in the? So not going to get the zero, are you? Let's instead of printing I, because remember everything's zero based in Python, we can print I plus one. Because it really matter. Oops. Sorry. Should quickly get through this. Okay, so we'll try that again. And here it goes one through six. That's better. So we could say two. And it saves us having to type in Professor Plum. We've got some issues later on because we've changed some stuff and we've commented out a whole bunch of things. So we don't have murderers or scene of crimes or suspects or whatever. But we're getting there. Are we happy with that now? I'm a happy camper. OK, let me rephrase that. I'm not happy. Why not? 
do you need to return the murderer that they've inputted from the function? Well, we could do that, but I'm probably just going to call the check solution within the function, so it saves us having to return it. So does the square bracket matter at all? Was that a question or a statement? That was a very much okay. a question. You're well, if we've added on to the change uh, the Jen's index, we're not going to chase it back. If we have added it on, so if it's instead of zero, it's one, instead of one, it's two, and instead of two, it's three. When we actually get it from the list, we need to take it back off again. So you're basically fixing the index and the list. Yeah. So we're changing it so that it looks better for the user. So instead of zero, one, two, three, four, five, it's one through six, which the user likes. But we still need to sort that out for our zero based suspects list so that if we choose number five, we know that that's the fourth one in our list. So we need to take the one off. The whole indexing and all that. Yep. So that's better. We now have a, a way to do it. So we have the murderer. So I'm going to take that code. And I'm going to replicate it for Any other change I need to make for the location? You wanted to look at the rooms rather than suspects. Anything else? Uh, the range, I think, is nine uh, with with location. Anything else? The choice. Choice. Yeah. So every time we've got a different choice, so what I'm going to do actually, instead of being specific, I'm just going to. I'll just reuse the same one each time. Anything else I need to do? Yeah, you need to change that variable from murderer to um, the scene of the crime. Okay, that was. Uh, What's the next bit? One? Scroll down. Pardon? Scroll no, down. So are we done with scene of crime? No, yep. because the list is still taking the suspects, isn't it? Oh, aye, aye. Always check your code. Remember right at the start, I said type in the stuff because it helps to understand what's going on. I would probably have been quicker typing that in again than I would have been going through and trying to figure out where each of the things, where each of the errors was. Yeah, but Tony, you just copied and pasted. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I would probably have been quicker just typing it rather than copying and pasting and then trying to figure out where the changes were that I needed to make. So All I'm saying is, if you're going to do it that way, be very careful because there might be quite a few changes that you have to make. You know, let's just count them. One, 
We don't have to change this because it's correct this time. Two. Uh, what is it called? Weapons. Three. Four. Five. So we had to make five changes and the one above we had to make six. You so still need to change mother. You need the mother. No, seven. Tony, I suppose uh, the question I'm going to ask is a silly question, but I just need to ask. You've just changed um, choice. You, you, you've you removed uh, mo uh, murderer choice and uh, room choice to make a choice. So each uh, each line is going to pick from a different, all the uh, their, uh, list, different lists. Yep. I, but that's just going to be the input. So that's just the number. And once we've used the number, for example, we use it here to give us our murderer variable. We don't need the choice again because we've set up murderer. And the same here when we get it okay. for the rooms and we set the scene of the crime, we don't need the choice anymore. So we can just reuse the same variable because we never actually have to go back to it again because we've stored the murderer, we've stored the scene of crime, we've stored the murder weapon. Well, if, you, if the user is not trying to type in the scene rather than the number, though, uh, it's going to give you an error, isn't it? Say that again, sorry? If the user is trying to type in the name of the things rather than its like in this, like, rather than its number, it's going to give you an error, isn't it? Because well, it's yeah. expecting an int. So you could You're on it, the please. try thingy, right? Like if it's like if it's like try input int or something, and then if it's not if it's not an integer, you could, you could ask him to enter uh, input you it could again. Make it clear by saying enter the number, quite right. Just in case it's not clear. Do you mean Nicholas that there's no error checking for the if they put um, in a, a a string rather than an integer? Exactly. So what I was against is like using the try exception thing, right? So when you put so that's the sort of thing that you're absolutely positively definitely going to do for your code. But given that it's already 1138 for a lecture that was supposed to have finished 40 minutes ago, I'm just going to cut some corners. So I'm not putting in that error checking, but you're quite right. You should. Hey, right, cheers. So we'll just quickly look at this to see what's going on. So it says who did it? Enter the number, number two. Where did it happen? Number three. And what did they use? Number four. OK, so it goes through, it gives us a different menu every time and gives us a number to put against it. And that right. should be better for the end user rather than having to type the whole name. Sorry, Nicholas, what did you say there? Uh, nothing, nothing. It works. So it's good. OK, so I want to do one last thing. I want to take this solution. I want to just. Um, I want to just put it into this. Am I correct function? So I'll actually check the solution within. Am I correct? So whoever asked earlier about not having these things, yeah, we'll just keep them in here because we don't need them elsewhere. I'll do one last thing just to. Tony, does that mean at the bottom you can get rid of solution equals guilty? Then. No. Why? I don't know. That's what I was asking. 
Anybody? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Um, because you need to put the your meet that solution you're calling the class or like your defeat is becoming the class. I got you, got you. Oh, yeah. Becoming an instance of the class, but yes. So that's us setting up who the guilty person is. So we still need to set that up. So we're setting up, we're setting up a random guilty person. Then we're checking if they are correct. I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to unhide display solution. And I'll set myself a wee reminder. OK, so I'm just allowing that to be available so that after I do this, I can say solution dot display the solution just in case we've done something wrong. Because we don't know if that code's working just now. We don't know what the answer was. It's been telling us no all along. It could have been true. Wow. Well, just turned it back on. And I'm just going to get it to display the solution instead. So we'll do our who did it, where they did it, what did they use? Yeah, it, it, never work. it never displayed in the top of the terminal. I think it is. It was. Try it again. Yes, again, because it was Mrs. White in the library with the revolver. If you didn't see what I did there, I missed out my brackets. It's becoming more and more important. OK. Yo, it feels like we're becoming programmers. That's the idea. OK, so I had said Professor Plum in the conservatory with the revolver, so I got one right. But it's still no printing out, Tony. Why is it like, you want to print out? Like, you try to print out the solution before you guess, am I right? No. No. Wouldn't be a guess if you knew for the answer. No, for testing purposes for, to see for if testing, the, I'm doing it afterwards to check whether, because it's saying guess again, Watson. So I don't know if the answer was wrong. It could be my program that's wrong. So by getting it to print out afterwards, I can check whether my guesses were correct or not. If you right. want to print, like if you wanted to print before, you just copy paste. If you it. print it before, but you can test whether or not the guess is correct. Did yes. You what I mean? Yes. What you're saying is what I was going to do next. Because I was going to ask you the question, OK, well, that has checked that we got it wrong. But what if we want to check the getting it right part? So you're quite right. What we could do is display it beforehand. So it's told us it was a Reverend Green in the ballroom with the pipe. So I can say number three, Reverend, oops. I can say number three and the number two with the number three. And it says, congratulations, Sherlock, you won. Well done, Watson. No, congratulations, Sherlock. Watson never gets it right. Tell me about it. And you can do all sorts of things with this. So for the check solution, so I've said it's for testing only. Actually, put that as part of the thing that we're printing out as well. Again, just to remind us to go back to it and not to leave it in there.
very cool. OK, so we've done a few things. We've encapsulated as much as we can. We've only allowed us to see what we wanted to see, both in terms of um, methods and attributes. Yep, Thomas, if you check your class, you'll find that murderer has been hidden with your two underscores. So when you go to print it out, you can't see it anymore. Uh, so when the, where is it printing? I had to print out underscore murderer rather than murderer. Or double underscore murderer rather. Because we'd set it up in our initialization as double underscore murderer. And remember, we can only use that within the class. Don't try and run it elsewhere. Any other questions? Just realized Jen's surname is Watson. God, I was really rude, I'm sorry. <laughs> can, can, can we see the full code, please, if possible? Which code, sorry? You were up early, Nicholas. Did you have to? Go? The full code. Uh, but no, because it's too long. But like I said, the code is all on the presentation. So all the codes in there. So you can grab the presentation and you can type it all in from there. OK. It builds up just the same way as I did. OK, so you can go to the uh, you can go to the slides and see it from there. Is that okay? Okay. Thanks. You'll see when Jerry did it, he actually had different choice variables. He had a murder choice, a room choice, a weapon choice. He also had different count variables, I, J, and K. The, um, that sounds like a whole lot of too much effort to me. Well, no, it depends what you're going to do. So I knew I wasn't going to need them. I knew I wasn't going to need I again. I was never going to need that loop again. So I just reused it. I knew I was never going to need murderer's choice again, so I just changed it to choice. But it will depend. Depending on what you're doing, you may need it again. I thought like you guys were completely against uh, against using single letters as, um, yeah. as variables. Absolutely. This is probably about the only time where um, that's allowed. Oh, so it's there are the, exceptions. It's from the early days of programming, wherever you did a for loop, it was just common to use I as the loop counter. And if you were doing loops within loops, you would use J. And if you're doing loops within loops within loops, you would use K. Um, and it's happened for you know 60 years. So it's probably about the only place where it's acceptable. It's just I for index. And everybody knows it because everybody uses it, even though we should put in something like count or loop or index number or whatever. All right. Uh, Abuyomi, the presentation is this one. You'll find it on Teams and on Aula. And one of the things it says in there is what today's exercise is. So for next week, it actually asks you to create this code. So if you've been following along, you've probably got most of it already. If not, check the slides and get the rest of it. But it's not just a typing exercise. Uh, 
you were asking earlier about it actually being a game. Right, well, that's where I've got questions. <laughs> well, the exercise is... Yeah, me too. Because, well, each player has a different coloured piece. Mm -hmm. Each player then goes into a certain location depending on the piece. Mm -hmm. Each person then rolls a dice and Miss Scarlet comes first. Yeah, and you can't, the be game the same, you can't be in the same location as another piece. Uh, exactly. And no, then you roll, you have to they be. roll, some... they roll, and they roll two dice. So how much, um, I'm just asking, what's the scope of this? Like, the scope how is much... as far as you want to take it. So if you want to just oh, say... Oh, Tony, that's not what I asked you. That's I not know. what I wanted to know. <laughs> I know, but implementing Cluedo, let's be honest, it's probably beyond what I would expect a first year to do. But on the other hand, some of you are enjoying it and want to keep going. And as Alistair's just said, that's exactly the word I was going to use. So you could, as we did in earlier weeks, say change location and you just teleport. Yeah, I'm going from the hall to the ballroom. Make it happen. Go. Right, so see if somebody rolls a dice, say, like, for basic terms, if they roll a six, they can move. Mm-hmm. Right, just to try and keep it in the this. So if they roll a six, they can move. If they don't, then they can't move. So you can have to factor in the roll of a dice. We can have them teleport, right? So we won't need a dice for that. Well, we you can. You can use but yeah, but the Cluedo's got two dices. That's why I'm saying, Nicholas. So you could, for example, if you wanted to set And then up. you have to then you have to shuffle the cards at the beginning and give every, every player a certain amount of yep. cards. From and we talked earlier section. about how you could shuffle the cards. So we could use, what could we use? Random dot, oh, what was it? Um, Random dot shuffle. It was, uh, it was choice and then there was the other one. You could have, for example, a couple of lists for the two die. Oh yeah, we wouldn't use we wouldn't use sample here though because they can both land on the same. Yeah, you would just use random choice and grab a couple of numbers. Yeah. So you could shuffle them. So you could say something like, and I'll just leave it beside it. Shuffled weapons becomes oops random dot what was it choice sample oh wait yeah sample because they can't have to yeah okay yeah, sample makes it and it was weapons and we had. How many we want? So what we can have is that. Yeah. So instead of candlestick, dagger, lead pipe, revolver, rope, spanner, it's now revolver, lead pipe, candlestick, spanner, rope, dagger. See, in regards to the player, should they be able to select what piece they play on the board or at randomly select? That's up to you. I genuinely can't remember the rules of Cluedo in terms of programming. Of course, you could do Oh, either. Tony, I've read them. Because oh, we actually read them last night. <laughs> Sorry, Jen, I um, sent them to you. <laughs> I know. Can not remember like, how to play it? So, do you need, how many, is there coloured pieces? Yeah, there was yeah. no counters. So, you could make them a random choice too. There's yellow, white, red, purple, green, and blue, all re in regards to 
like Colonel Mustard, the yellow type yeah. thing. You choose a piece. And the pieces are colored according to the colors of the suspects. What color was Mrs. Peacock? Blue. Blue. So you choose a piece, then the cards are shuffled. The guilty person, room and weapon gets hidden somewhere in an envelope. The other cards get distributed to the players. And then you're allowed to wander around and say, show me if you're if you have the ballroom card or you have the lead pipe or the whatever. I only if you're in a room, you have if to get a room. room. Yeah, so you would normally have to roll the dice. Move along the number of spaces to get to wherever it is you're going. And then there's shortcuts, there's secret passages. Yep. <laughs> One side of the board to the other. And that's why I'm saying you could put in as many of these things as you want. So you could do the, di the dice, or you could just say, nah, teleport to the lounge. So you could start to build it up. See, the way I was thinking about it is if they rolled a six, on dice, just one dice, they moved into a room. So it's not really actually how Cluedo works, but it would move into the room and then they could get a guess. Yeah, remember the previous one? Just out the room. Or know if there's a person in the room already. I can't find it, but we had a previous one where it said change location and we changed the location of where people were. So what you're probably wanting to think about is how you set up these pieces to begin with. So you probably have players and players will have. Who they are, where they are, what they have. Are they players randomly choice? Chosen or can From we? From Pluto, I think you're allowed to choose your own piece. Choose, well, but exactly. So, would we choose our own piece then? Yeah. So you could say, "Who do you want to be?" Using something like that, or you could do it randomly. And that's why I'm saying there's there's literally hundreds of hours of work in this if you wanted to do it. But what I want you to do is just. But how much are you looking for for this? <laughs> genuinely as much as you want to do. So I want you to add on something. So I don't want you to just leave it at what was in the slides. So I want you to extend we, for example, something. Depending on how far like, you go is entirely up to you. All right. I'll take that very literally. I'm sure you will. OK, so if you want to play around with programming, you want to do extra stuff, go for it. But if you want to just add in extra bits like setting up players, just do that. Because it's a start, it's a step on the way. Yeah, because every weapon is put in a room. In Cluedo. Randomly. At the start of the game. I mean, you could go that right. We have a list of the room and we have, uh, of the rooms, and we have a list of the weapons, right? So we could just have like a counter go down, and whenever mm -hmm. we just we just uh, assign them to the counters. So it then... doesn't matter if the lead pipes in the library at the time. If you guess that it was the candlestick in the library, it doesn't matter because that's within the guess. Am I talking pure crap? I don't think so, but I'm actually just reading the rules of Cluedo that you posted because I genuinely can't remember. <laughs> it's been so long since I've played it. I've never played it in my life. 
Oh, oh it's a lot out. quicker. It's a lot quicker than Monopoly. I, I must admit, everybody gets a wee sheet of paper that they can write down their suspects and all that. Oh, Monopoly would be really fun to code, I would think. Ah uh, well, get in there, Nicholas. You can do that yourself. <laughs> So with Cluedo, you have the rooms, locations and the weapons. You grab one of each and that's who did it, where and with what. You then deal out the rest of the cards to the other players. So you immediately know if, for example, you were dealt the lead pipe and Professor Plum in the ballroom, that it wasn't any of those. So you can take them off your list. It wasn't any of those. Then you move around the board. Once you go into a room, you can ask people if they have particular things. Do you have the ballroom? Do you have the lead pipe? And if they have, they show it to you and then you can check it off your list. So you basically just go around until you've checked off everything apart from the first three that were chosen randomly. But then if you make a final acquisition, you're out of the game. So once you think you know all three things, you say it was this person in this place with this item. If you get it right, you win. And if you get it wrong, you're done. So that's what I'm saying, there's quite a lot to do. And if you look at the board, you would have to work out how many um, spaces there were between each location. Oh, I'm not going to go that way, Tony. No well, way. that's why I'm <laughs> saying there's so much you could do, which is why you might want to start with teleport. So for those of you that haven't seen the game, there's the different locations, the billiard room, all the rest of it. There's a box in the middle where the cards are showing you um, who was randomly chosen. There are all the weapons. So the weapons go in particular places and you take your counters and you jump about going into rooms and there's the pad where you can tick off who's got what. Well, according to Google, Mrs. Peacock's the best one to pick because she's closer to every room. Sorry, I don't know how to help with that. Everybody starts in their own place. So that says start Professor Plum, start Miss Peacock and so on. So as you do have to roll the dice and get to rooms, I will believe Google, because I've never actually worked it out. As I was the youngest in the family, I was always given Miss Scarlet, so I would get to go first. But being Miss Scarlet <laughs> Sorry, for me over a decade, it will leave to another time. So that's why I'm saying there's a lot in there. There's a lot of stuff you can program. It becomes quite tricky. So what I want to do is think about putting in some things. Start off with setting up players. Think of what the players might want to have, what information that they have with them, what you're going to do to them, where they can go, what they can do. And just start building it up. Any other questions? Because I see from the time, we haven't just gone through the lecture, we've gone through the lab as well. It's now afternoon. No questions? Well, I'm just asking you not to expect too much. <laughs> I want you to add to what's in the lecture, but I'll leave it up to you. Uh, just a couple of the admin things. I'll put up uh, exercise two as your submission for next week. You really need to get these submissions in. I am being pressurised to give engagement 
figures. In other words, who's actually attending lectures. Whereas before, it was very simple. To what PSI go. level? Pardon? Oh, very good. To what PSI Um Tony, sorry for interrupting you. Um, when are we going to find out about the next assignment? As I was just about to come to. Oh, well, good mind, great minds think alike. Um, and I, I, Ben's wrong. It's not going to be implement a full Cluedo game. I wish it was. Um, yeah, so I'm been pressurised for engagement. I have no idea if you guys are engaging because, um, as I've pointed out before, sometimes I leave one of these meetings and people just stay on almost as though they've turned on their computers and wandered away to pretend that they were actually here listening. So the only way I can check engagement is to actually ask you to do something and submit it. That's the assignments. If you don't do them, I just have to assume that you're not engaging. And that's the list that I will pass on both for removal from the module, which is what the module coordinator will do. And if you're not engaging, possibly even removal from the course, which is what your program leader will do. You need to show me that you're engaging because there's only so long I can say, oh, well, it's really hard when we're online. They want some sort of figure and it's the only figure that I can give them. Um, assessment two is not available yet. It won't be a full Cluedo. It will be object oriented. Now, in previous years, what it's been is an extension of what you did for assignment one. But adding in more functions, so it's been moving stock around to different places. You know, you get you've got a a warehouse and you distribute 20 boxes of curly whirlies to location one and 30 boxes of curly whirlies to location two, that kind of thing. I don't know if I assume it will be similar. I don't know. I did ask yesterday, but I, I'm not sure yet. As soon as I have it, you'll have it. Tori, has there been any development of whether or not we get a pickup partner or is it random? One of these days I'll get to finish a sentence. The other thing we were talking about yesterday is in previous years it's been done in pairs. And we did wonder whether that was practicable this year or not. I'm actually quite interested in your thoughts on that. Would you prefer it to be pairs or would you prefer to work away on your own? Definitely pairs. In my oh, we could do it in a chat. We could just do it in a chat and just. Like, it depends on who you're going to get um, put with. In previous years, we've let you pick your own partners. Pairs we pick or alone, no random pairs. <laughs> oh, well, if we can pick our own people, then I uh, okay. Okay. Looking at the chat. There's no consensus, so um, I'll report that back to the module coordinator. Uh, it's his it's his choice in the end. Um, again, I'm just reading these chats as they're coming up. I'll pass these back just as a as a feedback to him. Um, I will let you know again as soon as I know. I Why don't you make point... a poll? Pardon? You could just make a poll and then that could be a more finite amount of information compared to yeah if we were still using Moodle I could use a poll but there's no such thing in Aula that I can find just make a but that would also imply that it's up to us anyway part of it is we're trying to be fair to you so again if if we're on campus and you're sitting in the class I can see that you're chatting to each other or whatever I just don't know remotely and I worry that we put you into pairs and either somebody does it and nobody does any work. And they get the points for it or somebody does it, nobody does any work and uh, nobody tells me right up to the last second. And we've got a whole pile of things to sort out about who actually gets any marks for. Them. So I'll take on board those comments. They're still coming in. I understand every single one of them and there are pros and cons for all of them. 
as I say, it's easier to bang heads together when you're on campus than it is here, and that's exactly why it came up again. Well, so sorry for interrupting, Tony. It's better to work in a team because that's what we're going to be doing anyway when we actually go into the world of work. But in the same sense of the word, we've no bonded with anybody, really. There is a few. In the real world, there's also the incentive of, you know, earning money and keeping your job. Yeah, but the point so of like what you're doing here, here yeah, but you still need to interact and stay in your course. What we're doing in the course is to try and prepare you for work, and that's a large part of why we do groups because it's what employers want. We know that students in the main hate working in groups because of all these issues, but we also know that employers require it, so we. We tend to do it a lot because it means that when you walk out, you can go, oh, yeah, I'm used to working with other people, used to working in groups. And it means you've had ways of figuring out how to do that well, because it can be tricky working in groups. Um, but as I say, we're in a different space just now, so there might be a possibility of change. So I will speak to the module coordinator. I will take on board what you've said and what you've written. And we'll see how we do. Also, if it's an extension of the first. Hang exam. on, there's somebody else not muted. Thank you. Tell me if, if if you do it in pairs and it's an extension Sorry. of the first assessment, then would that not imply that you've got two completely different programs to run from? Uh, Different. I don't know how completely different, given that you all had the same spec and all had to work by the same marking scheme. So there'd be stuff in there. That I yeah, think, but there's hundreds yeah. of ways to do things, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of it as well, sort of taking code and repurposing and trying to figure out which one's more useful. And that's all part of it. Which is why we still have a backup. And that's why we normally do it in pairs. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. I, I don't want you to misunderstand. I will take on board your comments. I will talk to the module coordinator about them, but it's his choice in the end, OK? So I did want to know what you think, but it's his choice in how we go ahead. Any other questions or comments? OK, uh, yes, Thomas, we are done for the day. I'm just going to stop the recording in case anybody's got any questions. <laughs>